I wanted to draw something that might be helpful. Augustine, or as I like to refer to him as Augie, talks about words, signs, and gestures as the three ways that we embodied creatures communicate. Signs tend to be things. Gestures and words are things that generate from our body, but signs are things that often are we, we create that are separate from our body. So I made a distinction that signs can originate as tools. They can simply be a functional thing, something that you use. But sometimes it can have significance. That is, it can be a sign which has one referent, means one thing. Or it actually can become a symbol, and it can become many things. And sometimes it can function simultaneously as all of those, depending on the context in which it's used and who sees it. Um, and there's all sorts of philosophical things behind that. But that just gives you an idea of, of where we've been. How we, what are the resources we have for communicating? And, and I suggested that artists, this is all artists have, because they're human. That's what we're limited to. And I suggested that music is one of the signs that we have, but it's not a physical sign. It's an aural sign. It's an uh, audible sign. Um, but also, art really functions mostly in the realm of the symbolic, because art opens up into possibilities. It doesn't close down possibilities. Um, now I'd like to shift to understanding of our imagination. Um, there's a book that, it, at the end of um, the outline, it, I was asked to suggest books. It's a book by Sandra Levy that I really like a lot. And my students over the years have said, don't get rid of that book. It's called Imagination and the Journey of Faith. And she's a pastor, and she's an artist, and she's someone who's really thought through carefully how you integrate imagination in ministry. And uh, it's, it's really quite good. And she follows a philosopher by the name of Coolridge by suggesting that we human beings have two imaginations. Uh, one is a primary imagination, sort of our first level imagination. The first level of imagination allows us to receive, to organize, and categorize the world. So we see something. And as we are growing up as a human person, we learn whether it's safe or unsafe, whether it's edible or not edible, um, whether it's friendly or not friendly, uh, whether uh, mom and dad like it or they don't like it. I mean, we, we place things in categories. And that helps us negotiate the world so that we see something that's like it. OK, that kitty has a white stripe down its long black tail Maybe I should pet it. And that you learn when you pet a skunk, that's not a good idea. So the idea that you have categories that help protect you and that when you guess wrong, you have to adjust is part of how we grow up in our life as a human person. The primary imagination is practical. It allows us to negotiate day in and day out life. But there's an imagination beyond that. That is, the imagination allows us to transcend the, the flat, the practical elements of our life. Aristotle called these two praxis, or practice, and poiesis, or poet, poetics. Um, uh, poiesis is the poetic, is the artistic. Um, Poiesis is that which allows you to see beyond the simple categories which we organize things and allow us to imagine things beyond. Allow us to imagine something that hasn't quite yet happened or that could happen. Um, it points beyond the simple truth to greater truths. It speaks of transcendence. It speaks of something bigger than us. 
Theologian Paul Tillich says that anything that speaks of issues of ultimate concern, life, of death, of love, of betrayal, those, those significant human experiences we have, anything that speaks of that, he says, is religious. Now note, he doesn't say it's religion. He doesn't say it's salvific. What he's saying is it has the function of pointing to something beyond the simple, the transcendent. It, it, it pushes you to think outside the flat everyday categories and ask you what sort of overarching values do you have to understand the world that you're living in. Um, this is where art and religion connect because art can help push us beyond the flat every day to step back and see what's the bigger picture? What are the values involved? What, what's, what is it that we can see beyond what's visible? That is the truth behind the truth. Um, it takes, according to Aristotle, techni or technique to be able to do that. Um, not everyone is an artist. Not everyone has the gifts, skills, capacities, the stick to to develop those skills to be an artist. Um, anyone with a cell phone, a smartphone, can take a picture. But not every photograph is art, as we saw earlier through the exhibits. I mean, um, there are people with a camera that can see things in certain ways that I could never see. That, that's, that's their gift. That's, their, that's the technique. That's, that's what makes it special. Um, those people who have this insight into the world and can see things that others can't and have the ability to articulate it in some form, that's the gift. Those are the great artists, aren't they? The people that can not only have an idea and put it into sound or shape or words, or motion. Those are the people that touch our souls, that change our lives. It's that techni that we thank God for. Um, it's without those people, we overlook things that we should be seeing. We don't see the truth beyond the truth. Um, it requires a skill. It's a craft. It requires practice. Practice. This is the unique place of an artist in the world. Um, in the medieval world, there are patrons that paid you to do your art. Sometimes there are still patrons. But most artists have struggled. Um, in some research I did on music, I was really fascinated to find out that Mozart made most of his money teaching music lessons. Because his music wasn't as beautiful as it was, wasn't paying the bills. So when we teach our course in Christian vocation, one of the things that our artists in New York City, one of the most expensive places to live in the world, uh, describes how they put their life together in such a way that they can afford to live and can afford to do their art at the same time. And, and that challenge for so many people, former New Yorker can relate to that. Um, so artists, so artists in the church, we have a program in the Brem Center in Seattle where we have churches adopt artists for six months to live in and be part of their ministry and, and to have them speak into the life of the church. Uh, you know, what, a, what a vision to, to be able to take these people and, and to support them, to have a congregation support their art. Um, maybe your congregation could think about that. Um, artists help us see beyond the truth and its meaning and appearance to the beauty behind it. As I pointed out before, 
Um, beauty in English, the opposite is not ugly. But the opposite is glamour. Uh, I love Cecilia Gonzalez, Gonzalez Andrea's definition. Because truth, um, beauty can be harsh, but honest. But glamour can never be harsh. It always has to be pleasing and isn't always truthful. To communicate beauty takes technique or skill or an artist. And this is why, as Christians, we should value the artist because the artists are pointing all of humanity to the transcendent, raising the questions that we believe Jesus Christ answers. So we should look at arts as friends because they ask to raise the questions for which the gospel provides the answers. So one of the things that I've been arguing, uh, following my good friend Augie, is that we have bodies, and bodies are important. So I'd like to begin with the Jewish understanding of body from Genesis 2, where God took a handful of primordial stuff, dust, and breathed into it, ruach, nefesh, same word for breath is the same word for spirit. And the understanding of a Jewish uh, person, a Jewish understanding of a human person, is a body with animating life force, with breath in it, which is different than the Greek-Roman understanding of a body with the soul. And the soul's primary in the Greco-Roman world. But for Jews, the body was primary. When, when you died, for a Jew, you gave up the breath. The old King James word in English would give up the ghost. It was the Holy Ghost. You give up the spirit. Um, so we are animated bodies. And we actually learn through our bodies. We experience life through our bodies. And as a performance artist, and someone interested in performance art, um, I really want to invite you to think for a moment about how important bodies are, not just in the performance in our arts, but in all of human life and in your art in particular. Uh, we have three schools at Fuller, School of Intercultural Studies, a School of Theology, and a School of Psychology. And I work with some of my psychology colleagues. We work in the area of embodied cognition. That is how we learn through our bodies. We think we learn through our brains, but our brain's simply a part of our body, and that we experience the world through senses, and we actually remember things in our body. Um, I remember when I was young, I cut my hand fairly badly. I was about four years old. And when I talk about it, I always make that motion because I remember the feel of that knife hitting my hand in this hand, in my hand. I, mean, I can still remember it. In the same way that you can remember the taste of the last delicious meal you had on your tongue. Your body actually remembers things in your body, not just in your head. And that's important to note because our bodies are a repository of our experiences and our identity. So we use our bodies to communicate signs, words, and gestures. But we also send and receive everything physically. So we not only send forth, but we receive everything bodily. In the arts, we create with our bodies plastic arts. So we have paintings, sculptures, physical things that we create apart from ourselves would be plastic arts. We also create using our bodies in performing arts, dance, mime, theater. But I'd suggest that theater actually is a hybrid performance art. Um, there was someone here who does scenery in state. There, there you are, a plastic art in the middle of a performance art. So, in theater, you have both the plastic art and the performance art working together. Um, opera would be another example. Um, so in our performances, we create things with our bodies, but also create things for our bodies to be augmented, whether they're costumes or backdrops. So that being said, now let's get to the point. The most important thing you can get away get from this talk right now is that you are not an octopus. Okay, Write that down. I am not an octopus. 
Why is that important? Does everyone know what an octopus is? Did I communicate that one? <laughs> okay. Let's imagine mommy octopus and daddy octopus come to this wonderful hotel for their honeymoon, maybe that aquarium that greets you and you come up to the front. And when they come back, mommy octopus is pregnant. It happens on honeymoon sometimes. Um, well, in the octopus world, daddy octopus dies right after mommy octopus gets pregnant. Uh, mommy octopus then creates a number of eggs. And when she gives birth, she gives birth to a sack of many eggs. And she hangs these on the roof of a cave, and then she will sit below them with her siphon blowing seawater past them because God has created octopus, octopi, uh, to get nutrition through the nutrients in seawater. And she will sit down there protecting them, just feeding them by blowing water past them. And she'll keep looking up at those little octopi, waiting for them to get ripe, waiting for them to get big enough that they can go out and venture forth in the world. So one morning, she looks up and says, my babies are ready to go. She takes one big gulp of seawater and blows those little baby octopi out of the cave into the ocean. And she dies. Those little octopi, are pretty small, so they float above the sea bottom. But on their way down, they'll eat little things that they come along, and that makes them heavier, and then they sink to the bottom. Some of them, when they hit the bottom, are going to get eaten by shrimp and other bottom dwellers. Um, some of them simply won't make it down to the bottom, a fish will eat them before they get there. But some, maybe out of 50, three or four, will survive. And they have everything they need to know about being an octopus in their DNA. You are not an octopus. If I took you the moment you were born and left you alone anywhere in this world, you would die. God created you with a need to be nurtured, to be cared for, to be held, to be taught. This is actually the beginning of performance. We are geared, God created us, to watch, to imitate, and be corrected. Our whole lives are based on the premise that there's a community around us that loves us, that's going to guide us to help us be healthy human beings. So we watch and we imitate. We make sounds that we hear. And if we make a sound that sounds like a word, our parents reinforce it. And if we make a sound that doesn't sound like much, they ignore it. So we don't say that sound again. This is how we learn to become a human person. We learn by induction. We learn by watching. Philosopher Paul Woodruff has argued in a, year, in a book from the year 2000, almost 20 years ago now, before smartphones, that we have lost the ability to observe each other. We have lost the ability to have our behaviors corrected. And therefore, we need theater. Because theater is where the actors interact with each other, and you watch appropriate and inappropriate behaviors on stage. And then you watch the audience react, and it reinforces what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. And you learn through those interactions and reinforces the values of your culture the truths of your culture. We learn by imitation. We learn by observation. So um, Kurt's the only person left in the Covenant Church. So we, we, I, we moved from my doctoral studies in Indiana to the city of Chicago, where I began teaching. And we moved next door to dear friends of mine and uh, uh, the wife is a, uh, the worship pastor at Kurt's church. So, I, so we move next door. I have five children, and they have four children. And the first thing that Don and I did, the, the two dads did, was we ripped out the fence in between our two homes. So our children were running in and out the back door, okay? 
And it got dinner time, and you know, it didn't matter how many, as long as there were five kids, however many were mine, how many were theirs, we just fed them and hoped that the others were getting fed at the Hodgkinson's. So, I was just... so one day, after about three months of basically living like that with our friends, my daughter, Kari, one of our triplet daughters, comes up to me and says, Dad, she's about four years old, do you know there's two ways to say, oh, no? Kari, how do you say, oh, no? She says, you can say, oh, no, or you can say, oh, no. And I thought... How, how did she learn that? Do I say it differently? Does my wife say it one way and I say it another way? Regardless, my daughter was observing. She was paying attention. And now she's testing. Dad, am I right? There's two ways to say, oh, no. This has a lot to do with Christian formation. It has a lot to do with Christian formation because people are watching us, especially young people about what it means to be a, a Christian. The research I'm doing right now says the most important people that form your faith in worship are the people sitting immediately around you. Because those are the people who are reinforcing what you should be doing at the time. The worship leaders are actually secondary to the people around you. Now, performance creates conversation. We come as people throughout our lifetime that observe, that imitate, that get corrected. But performance arts create conversations in ways that other arts can't. Um, it creates conversation between the artist and the audience. It creates an implicit conversation because when you're on stage, you're getting feedback for how it's going, how the audience is responding. If you're a musician, if you're an actor, if you are a dancer, you have a sense of how well things are going. You can, you can hear the clearing of the throat. You can hear the shuffling of the feet. You can, you can hear the silence. You can hear those things, and you're getting feedback on how it's going. You know that if you're in the part of a, a very intense part of a play, and people are laughing, and it's not funny, you're missing the boat. So, so there's a dialogue that takes place. There's a dialogue that takes place within the audience. And again, first is nonverbal. You're watching each other respond. You're watching each other sort of, what do you think about this? How are they responding? Uh, are they uh, engaged in it? Are they disengaged? Are they interested? Are they leaning into it? Are they sitting back? Then, of course, there's the intermissions, and you actually have verbal conversations about it. Um, sometimes these experiences can be deeply moving for all, both the performers and the audience, because there are moments of connection that take place when something really is magical, when something's happening that transcends simply the performance of a piece of art that creates connections between people through the art. And those are the moments we all live for. These are especially important for artists who are in the church because artists can help us make those connections. If you think of it this way, words are often used in evangelical churches as tools. It's doctrine. It's sort of, here's, here's the, the flat. Here's, here's, here's the truth. The artist can augment that with the truth beyond the truth, to point beyond that, to, to look at the bigger picture, to look at not just the content of the philosophical truth, but the emotional impact of that truth. Um, we say on Easter Sunday, Christ is risen. It's one thing to say it on Easter Sunday. It's another thing to say it at a loved one's funeral because that's an existential truth that gives hope. And it's that Easter faith in a different context that has that different impact. 